Yes. Okay. So what I'd like to tell you about is um, uh, this data that we got recording from large numbers of neurons, 10,000, uh, which by the standards of this sort of data is about as much as you can get, uh, recorded simultaneously from the visual cortex, primary visual cortex, known as V1, um, area, cortical area V1, uh, from, from mice that were looking at images. Um, we saw something unexpected uh, experimentally, uh, and it, it was a quantitative law, which is actually quite rare in biology. That led us to do some math to understand uh, what it might mean, which in turn led to a experimental prediction, which we were able to test. This is stuff uh, done by uh, primarily Carson Stringer and Marius Pachatariu, formerly uh, of the Gatsby uh, Computational Neuroscience Unit, and then they moved to our lab, uh, the lab that Matteo Carandini and I run uh, in the Cruciform building at UCL. Um, these two have now gone on to their own group in uh, uh, the US, uh, and it came out in a paper last year, um, which I can send you if, if you don't have access uh, from home. Um, okay, so this is about um, information coding in the brain. Um, and the way we think the brain encodes information is actually not too different to the way a artificial neural network encodes information. And indeed, that's why it's called a neural network because it was modeled after the brain. Um, and, and so what I'm going to define as the, the population code is, is really something very simple. It's a correlation. So, so the idea is that you see a particular image, the light comes into your eye, falls onto the retina, and that causes a pattern of activity in the brain. Some neurons will start firing, will become active, they'll fire action potentials, um, and others won't. And so you can summarize the activity pattern in the brain that's caused by this sensory stimulus uh, as a set of numbers that summarizes the firing rate, the level of activity of each of these uh, neurons. So if you've got n neurons, the population code for an image is an n-dimensional vector, and that's just like you'd have in an artificial neural network or, or anything else even though the circuitry is very different. You know, it's not a feed-forward network. It doesn't learn through backprop, we think. Um, so many differences, but one thing in common is that it represents inputs by feature vectors, by population vectors, as, as we call them in neuroscience. And the idea is that when you have different images, they give you different representations, different feature vectors, and the feature vectors are a transformation of the image, of the input, in a way that makes downstream processing useful. The cortex is just one part of the brain. It's not the part that makes decisions, as far as we know, but it does reprocess the input in a way that presumably is useful for what's downstream. Okay, so what's a, a way that the brain might process uh, information, uh, sensory information might transform it into feature vectors that could be useful. Well, we've only just recently been able to record enough neurons to, um, to answer that experimentally, but theories have been around a long time. And one of the best ones, uh, now very old, going back to the 1960s or, or even before, is the idea that population codes should be orthogonal. Um, so what does this mean? Um, if you've got a particular input, um, you can think of it as causing activity uh, in a, a set of neurons. So this, this grid here, every circle represents a neuron, and the green filled in ones are the ones that are firing. And, and this, as we said, defines a vector in an n-dimensional space if there are n neurons. So the idea is now that if you have another completely different image come along, it should activate a completely different set of neurons. In other words, the vectors should be orthogonal, their dot product should be close to zero. And why would you want this property of orthogonality? Well, um, the, the motivation for, for Barlow, 
was that this maximizes um, information transmission measured in bits per spike. So if every uh, one of these, if, if the constraint for the brain is energy and it's the spikes, the firing that cause, costs energy, um, then uh, a sparse code like this, uh, where the different stimuli are orthogonal, would, would maximize uh, that information per energy. But there's another reason, um, which I think makes a lot of sense, which is that if you imagine a downstream network learning to associate desired behaviors with these patterns, um, and it's learned to associate, um, even just in one trial, um, a, a downstream neurons have, have, have strengthened their weights onto these green ones and learned to respond to the tree by, you know, initiating a program of action appropriate for a tree, then when this new stimulus comes along, there'll be no interference with the previously learned stimulus because they're orthogonal. So, so this orthogonality can actually afford you one-shot learning. If the, the cortex is able to orthogonalize the inputs, then downstream structures can do one-shot learning on them. That's one of many advantages to orthogonality. On the other hand, orthogonality can't be the whole story because you might imagine that now you've got another stimulus, which is almost the same as the one you just saw. Um, it's again a tree, it's a slightly different type of tree. If that caused a completely different pattern of activity, there could not be generalization. There's no way that the, the brain could respond to this second uh, pattern, um, uh, could generalize what it's learned to the first to the second. So what we need is that nearby inputs generate nearby outputs. So it's not enough for the code to be orthogonal for distant inputs. It needs to vary smoothly so that small changes in inputs lead to small changes in output. And when I say a small change in input, um, uh, let me clarify one thing, which is that I don't mean necessarily small change in pixel space. Ah, come back. Um, it needs to be a, a small change in the space of actions these uh, inputs should evoke, right? So the, the kind of conceptual space. Is this making sense so far? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Um, all right, so, so let's continue. All right, so, so now let's try and imagine in, in a more abstract level um, what this is saying. So the idea is you've got a space of possible stimuli. It's a high dimensional space, very high dimensional space of all possible images. But let's just visualize it by this uh, torus. And then the idea is that what the brain does is take this space of possible stimuli, which is, uh, and, and then uh, in the, the different uh, input patterns would lie in different parts of this space. And the brain would take it and put it into a higher dimensional space where N now is the number of neurons in the cortex, which is more than the number of photoreceptors in the retina, and do so in such a way that the, the um, inputs are transformed so that inputs that require similar outputs are close together and inputs that require different outputs um, are, are, are far apart. And this is similar, if you like, to the idea of the kernel trick. Um, and the, the fact that the, um, inputs are getting put into this high dimensional space that makes a linear readout possible uh, is exactly the idea of the kernel tree. And, and there's reasons to think that this is what, in, in some sense, the cortex is doing. So the question now is what can we learn experimentally about the geometry of this uh, manifold of stimulus representations in the cortex? And this is where the experimental data comes in. So, um, in order to understand um, the geometry of that manifold, we need to do two things. The first is we need to present lots of sensory stimuli. Uh, and, and the second is we need to record lots of neurons. And, and the reason is that if we don't do that, we'll by definition get something low dimensional. If we only presented four stimuli, then the, um, the vectors they evoke would by definition lie in a four-dimensional plane. So we need to present lots of stimuli and what we do is present about 3,000 natural images taken from the ImageNet database 
And for technical reasons that I'll come to later, we need to present them twice each because we're going to do an analysis method based on cross-validation. The second thing is to record lots of neurons. And I don't know, can you see them moving here? Can, can you see a movie? Uh, yeah, but it's not very smooth. Uh, yeah, that may be as good as, as good as we get. So what I hope you saw was um, a lot of flashing dots. Let's look at it again. A lot, a lot of flashing dots and then zooming out to reveal lots and lots of planes of this. So this is a experimental method called two photon microscopy. Um, can I ask, who's, who's heard of two-photon microscopy? Has anyone heard of two-photon microscopy? I'll take that as a no. No one has. No. So, um, so it's, a, it's a method that um, lets you visualize the response of large numbers of neurons at the same time. That basically, then there's a gene called uh, GCAMP, which is an artificially designed protein, um, which uh, it was uh, genetically engineered originally from a um, protein in a jellyfish called green fluorescent protein, but it was engineered such that it only becomes fluorescent in the presence of calcium. And neurons, generally speaking, have a low concentration of calcium inside the cells, but when they are active, calcium comes in. So if you have a protein that's only fluorescent when there's calcium, then when the neuron is active, it glows. And when we saw that flashing just now, that's because the neurons become active and calcium comes in and we can see their activity. It's a bit like if you've watched any of those old, um, you know, horizon documentaries about the brain, they show all these neurons and they flash as an illustration of their electrical activity, because it's really electrical activity. But with this protein in them, they, you can actually see them flash when they're active. Um, and uh, with genetic engineering, it's possible to have uh, a mouse where all the neurons express this GCAMP, uh, calcium sensitive fluorescent protein. And then using a device called a two photon microscope, uh, you can see uh, down to uh, about half a millimeter of depth um, uh, into the brain. And that lets you record the activity of about 10,000 neurons simultaneously. It's really quite incredible technology. We didn't invent any of the experimental technology. Um, but uh, what also had to happen was developing software that would let you analyze this data. So the question of detecting the cells in these images, that's actually a difficult problem, which um, Marius um, was able to solve by developing a, a program called a Sweet 2P, uh, which is really what enabled all of this work to, to happen. Okay, so anyway, that's the experiment. The outcome of the experiment is that you get a big old matrix. And the matrix has sized the number of cells by the number of stimuli. And it's really dimension 10,000 by 3,000, and there are two of them, one for each repeat. Um, but I'm showing you here just a subset of the most so sorted, uh, of the cells most tuned. So every column here represents a, a neuron that was recorded, every row a stimulus, and it's red when that neuron responded to that stimulus. And you can see there's some <clears throat> uh, groups of cells that respond to some groups of stimuli, uh, and different cells respond to different stimuli. And, and this is showing what the population code looks like, um, which cells are responding to which stimuli. The cells and the stimuli are sorted here uh, so that um, similar cells and similar stimuli are close together in this, in this map. So this is the information the brain has. And you can say, you can ask a question, if all I saw was the, um, <clears throat> was the firing of these neurons, the activity of these neurons, could I predict what stimulus was presented? And the answer is a yes. So this graph here shows a, a decoding analysis, and it's the simplest decoder you can think of, a nearest neighbor uh, decoder. And you take the uh, 
you take a random subset of n neurons up, up to about 10,000. And then we try and decode from that which of the 3,000 stimuli was presented. So chance level is 0.03%. Uh, uh, and this shows the performance of the decoder as a function of the number of neurons. And you see it increases and increases and gets to about 90% compared to chance level of 0.03. So the information about the images is there in the visual cortex. The question is what format is it in? What's the geometry of that representation? Okay, so, so and, and the question we started off with, not the one we ended up with, but what we started off with is, is what is the planar dimensionality of, um, of this um, manifold? And what I mean by that, so in this illustration, um, it's a two-dimensional manifold in the sense that um, it, it's topologically a two-dimensional torus that's been twisted around uh, into this um, illustration of a three-dimensional space. So it has an intrinsic dimension, which is two. But it's, it's possible that that two-dimensional surface in this illustration actually lies not on the, on, on the subplane of this n-dimensional space. So, for example, it might be that it lies on a four-dimensional plane within this 10,000-dimensional space. That's an experimental question. And, and the, the way we find that out is, is just by principal component analysis, or a little tweak of it you'll see in a moment. So, what principal component analysis does is it measures the size of the manifold in, in, along the orthogonal dimension. So, if we, if we take the first principal component, its variance measures the diameter, if you like, along the, the main uh, principal axis, the second one, um, the third one, etc. And if after a while, these become zero, then we know that the manifold lied in a, in, in a subplane, a, a low dimensional plane within the full space. And that will tell us what is the planar dimension. It has to be at least D, where D is the intrinsic dimension, it could be N, the full dimensionality of the space, or it could be less. That was the question we started off asking. The data led us to realize that wasn't really the best question. Um, but um, let me tell you first a little bit about how we do it. So um, as I said, we needed to present each stimulus twice. And the reason for that um, is that the, the cortex, the even the visual cortex, isn't just representing visual stimuli. So um, there are cells there that respond to vision, but they're also modulated by all sorts of other things. So for example, if the, the mouse starts running, then um, you have cells that fire more or less. If the mouse twitches its nose, there's cells that fire more or less. So the visual cortex isn't just about vision. And, but for this project, we want to focus only on visual processing. So the way we do that is, is with the following approach. You take the, the data, the uh, training set, and you do uh, a singular value decomposition on that. Um, and you get out of it a set of, uh, of, of principal component vectors, 10,000 dimensional principal component vectors. And we project that onto the training data and we get PCA of the, um, of the data set. So this is number of principal components by number of images. But to find out um, what the stimulus related variance is, we need to take the second presentation of those images and, and project it onto the same vectors that were computed from the first presentation. That gives us a second um, set of responses. And you can show that if you take, if you measure the covariance of the, uh, principal components across the two repeats, you get an unbiased estimate of the, what we call the signal variance, or in other words, the, the stimulus related variance, the variance of the visual uh, response. And, and the proof of that is really very simple. The, the, um, the visual response is defined to be the mean over all potential presentations of the signal. Um, and if the noise is independent between the two repeats, then the expectation of, of the covariance, the covariance, um, is equal to 
uh, the, the product of the, of, of the two means, so it's a signal variance. Uh, is this making sense? Yep. Okay. Um, oh, got a chat. Chat. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So, so here's the result, and it really wasn't what we were expecting because we were all about is it going to go to zero after a while. The so the answer to that question is no, it doesn't go to zero. So if we plot um, the dimension number on the x-axis and the cumulative variance on the y-axis, um, then what we see is that the amount of variance just goes up and up and up. Here we're on a log linear scale. So the, it isn't low dimensional. It doesn't lie in a low dimensional plane. That was our question. But the interesting thing is that this line is pretty close to being straight. And you may know that the sum of 1 over n is approximately log n. Uh, and what that tells you is that the variance in the nth dimension must be about 1 over n for this to look straight. And you can make that clearer if you plot it on a log-log scale. In not cumulative, but just the, the variance in the nth dimension on a log-log scale, you can see that over two or three orders of magnitude, um, it follows this power law with an exponent just above one. Um, and it's true for every one of the experiments. Every one of the experiments, when we make this plot, um, shows that the variance in the nth dimension um, is approximately uh, one over n. The exponents are always just a little bit above one, 1.04, 1.09, there's a slight variability between the experiments, but all basically the same. And that was just unexpected, because it's not very often that you see quantitative laws in biology. In fact, I don't think I've hardly ever seen it, that you get anything at all in biology that follows, looks anything like a straight line on, on any axis. So this was really quite a surprise. And we spent a long time wondering what it might mean. And the first thing, obviously, is it might be some sort of artifact, some sort of experimental error. And, and there was all sorts of things we did to check for that. The most convincing one uh, to me uh, is, is we just took, we presented a new set of images. So rather than taking 2,800 images, we took 32 images and repeated them all 96 times each. Um, and 30, so that means that we've got the same stimulus presented again and again, but we've only got 32 of them. And as you know, 32 points have to lie in a 32 dimensional plane through the origin. So if we do the same analysis, we ought to find now that it is low dimensional, that it's 32 dimensional. And that's actually exactly what you get. If you plot the cumulative variance versus PC dimension for this case of 32 images repeated, you find that it saturates at 32. So the method is working. If it was low dimensional, it would give us low dimensional. So this power law looks like it's holding fast. So another question is, what would happen if we had more neurons or more images? We, we can't technically do those experiments. We can only record 10,000 images, sorry, 10,000 neurons, and only present about 3,000 images. Um, but what we can do is take a subset of the data and see how it looks with that. So this is showing now uh, increasing fractions of the total number of neurons. What does the power law look like? What does the, the, the variance spectrum of the principal components look like? And you see that the more neurons you add, the further out this power law extends. And we can plot here the power law exponent as a function of the number of, of neurons, or at the bottom, the number of stimuli we're showing. And the more you add, the closer it gets to a power law of exponent one, or just above one. So it looks like we've got some sort of limiting behavior. Um, another thing that you might think is that this is coming from the image itself. So as you might know, natural images themselves follow power laws. So if we take our images, and we do SVD just on the pixels of the image, then we get something that looks a lot like a, a power law with an exponent close to one. So maybe 
the neural power law is following this power law in the image itself. So to test that, we take the images and we filter them with a whitening filter that breaks the power law. Now look, it's nothing like um, this one over n spectrum, but the neural spectrum is still very close to one over n or, or, or n to the minus alpha with alpha just above one. So it's not inherited from the image statistics. There's a whole lot of things it isn't. So what does it mean? What we found is that the eigenspectrum, the variance spectrum of the principal components, converges to a limit as the number of neurons tends to infinity and the number of stimuli tends to infinity. So what does this tell us? Uh, and, and this is where the math comes in. All right, so first, what does it mean to talk about the number of neurons tending to infinity? It's kind of absurd because yes, the brain has a lot of neurons, but it's well short of infinity. So how can you consider a limit where the number of neurons, which is actually fixed, tends to infinity? Actually, it's something you do all the time, any time you do any sort of experiment at all that uses statistics. So, so for example, suppose that we'd said, as something common in neuroscience, that the firing rates of these neurons followed a log normal distribution. It doesn't need to be this exact statement, um, just saying that any experimental observation follows a probability distribution. This, strictly speaking, isn't true. There's a finite number of neurons, so they follow a discrete distribution. They can't possibly follow a continuous distribution because only an infinite population can follow a continuous distribution. What you really mean is that the ob experimental observations look like a sample from an infinite population that follows that distribution. So if I say the heights of everybody in the world follow a Gaussian distribution, it's probably not true, but let's just let's, let's say it for example, it couldn't be true um, because there's only, you know, 7 billion people in the world, way short of infinity. But what it means is that those 7 billion, their heights look like a sample from a Gaussian distribution. And so anytime you do science at all, you're considering this limit that the size of the population tends to infinity. And, you know, the, in the case of the heights of the people in the world, you can't let the number of people in the world tend to infinity. But what you're saying is that these people look like a sample of an infinite distribution. And this distribution is all the people who might conceivably live in the world, consistent with the sample that you've got. It's not all the people in the world. You might record 100 people's heights. The infinite population isn't everyone in the world. It's everyone that might conceivably live in the world. So, so now let's translate this back to the case we were talking about. The difference here to conventional science or conventional statistics is that we're letting two things go to infinity. First, we're considering all the stimuli we possibly could have shown. And that's not just all the things in the ImageNet database. It's all of the images that could conceivably have been in the ImageNet database. Next, we're considering all the cells that the brain could conceivably have contained, not just all the ones it does contain, all the ones it could conceivably have contained. And we consider those both to be drawn from a probability distribution. So now we've got this infinite set of conceivable stimuli, infinite set of conceivable neurons, and we define the response of each one of this infinite set of cells to each of, each of this infinite set of stimuli, and we give it a name, phi of CS, the noise-free response. And the idea is that the actual responses look like a sample from these distributions. Obviously, we can't measure phi because it's an infinite thing, but we can use tools of statistical inference to constrain something about this infinite population code, even from these finite samples. And, and this is something called functional data analysis that hasn't seen much use in neuroscience, but is used a lot in time series, for example. So the idea is that the response to a stimulus S defines a dimension, a vector of dimension, the number of neurons. As the number of neurons tends to infinity, 
this becomes a vector in a Hilbert space, in an infinite dimensional space, which is an L2 space on the over the set of all possible um, possible neurons. The dot product, which is what we use in PCA, uh, gets replaced by the kernel function. So the dot product of two uh, vectors gets replaced by the kernel function, which is the expectation over all possible cells the brain might have contained of their response uh, to the two stimuli, S and S prime. And this defines a continuous function on, on the different, uh, uh, on a pair of uh, uh, stimuli drawn from their, their stimulus space. And we can do something called functional principal component analysis, where which is the analog of ordinary principal component analysis, where now we expand the, the, the kernel function here, k of s, s prime, as a sum of um, outer products of eigenfunctions uh, weighted by eigenvalues. As with conventional PCA, the eigenfunctions are orthonormal, uh, here defined by an expectation rather than by a sum. Um, but unlike conventional PCA, there can be infinitely many of these eigenvalues. So, so in, in, in ordinary PCA, there's a finite number of eigenvalues. In functional PCA, there's an infinite number of eigenvalues, but at least subject to a constraint of uh, compactness of this kernel function, they need to converge towards zero. Okay, any, any questions at this point? Because the math is only going to get more complicated after this. Uh, yeah, I have a question. <coughs> yes. um, are you looking at settings where the spectra will be continuous or discrete? Oh, definitely discrete. Okay. Definitely discrete. Uh, we're going to assume compactness of the kernel operator. Any, any other questions? Okay, great. Um, all right, so, so the main mathematical result we need uh, is um, functional, uh, from functional principal component analysis, is, is this one uh, from, from this paper here, which roughly speaking says that as the number of neurons and stimuli tends to infinity, if you do sample PCA, you sample a random number of neurons and a random number of stimuli, and, and you do PCA on that, then the eigenvalues you get from that PCA converge to the eigenvalues of the kernel function. So what this means is that from our finite sample of neurons and stimuli, we can make an inference about the, the kernel, the kernel function of the entire infinite population of um, neurons and stimuli. So we infer that the kernel function has a power law eigenspectrum. So what does that mean? Okay, we have made some progress. We've gone from this puzzling observation to something quite general, that the kernel function has a power law eigenspectrum. But what does that mean? Okay, so, so here's the intuition, is that higher principal components of the kernel function encode finer stimulus features. So let's turn back to the experimental data. What this shows is a matrix with neuron on the x-axis and image number on the y-axis, and they're sorted, again, so that nearby neurons are close together uh, and nearby images are, uh, are, are, are similar. But what we've done is we've projected the activity onto just the first two PC dimensions, and you see it's smooth. We've got all of these neurons responding to all of these stimuli, and then a, a blue patch and then a red patch. If we look at higher dimensions, though, you see finer and finer details emerge as we go to higher and higher dimensions. So by the time we're now here in the hundreds of dimensions, you've got just small numbers of neurons, small sets of neurons responding to small sets of images. So the higher PC dimensions encode finer and finer stimulus features. So what the eigenspectrum means is it measures how much weight the brain is giving to fine details of the stimulus compared to the coarse details of the stimulus. The slower the eigenspectrum decays, the more weight the brain gives to the fine details, and the faster it decays, the more weight it gives to the, to the coarse details. And the point is that the eigenspectrum can decay too slowly to be of any use. 
Uh, and this is what we're going to formalize now with some, some theorems. If the eigenspectrum decays too slowly, then the fine details together swamp everything else. You can't see the forest for the trees. The coarse details no longer matter. And there's two ways that the eigenspectrum can decay too slowly. First, if it decays more slowly than n to the minus one, uh, then the code, the neural code, population code, the, the feature vector code, can't be continuous. Second, if it decays slower than n to the minus one minus two over d, where d is the intrinsic dimension of the, the stimulus manifold, then the code cannot be differentiable. So let's see what this means. So the first theorem says that decay slower than n to the minus one, and remember the observation we got experimentally is that it decays just slower, just faster, excuse me, than n to the minus one. Slower than n to the minus one would be pathological. And, um, and, and what you can prove, and it's in the supplementary material of that paper I quoted, is that if the eigenspectrum does not, does not asymptotically decay faster than n to minus one, then either the kernel function is discontinuous or the population variance um, is infinite, meaning that there's uh, the expected variance over all cells and stimuli of the activity of a neuron is, is infinite. And, and both of these are absurd. You couldn't have this, it just couldn't make any sense. And, and you wouldn't want this because you'd have no generalization. Um, and the sketch, the proof basically is the fact that if it decayed slower than n to the minus one, then the sum of the eigenvalues would be infinite. And using Mercer's theorem, uh, you can relate that to, if k was continuous, you could relate that to the expectation of the diagonal of the kernel matrix, which would show that if you've got continuity, then you have, have to have infinite variance. Okay, there's a kind of converse to this, which is that if you have decay faster than n to the minus one, you have this nice property, which we call holographic coding. So the idea is if the code has a finite eigenvalue sum, then you can reconstruct the entire infinite dimensional population. Remember, because it's a vector in a Hilbert space, you can re reconstruct that uh, Hilbert space vector to any degree of accuracy you require by sampling a sufficiently large number of neurons. And, and it's a fairly simple proof. You, you, pick a cell at random and you predict it by linear re regression from the rest. And if there's po finite population variance, you can show this means the prediction converges. So the idea biologically is that in the brain, there are lots of neurons in the cortex, but any neuron downstream of that only can listen to a very small number of them. And what you would like is it doesn't really matter which subset of neurons this downstream cell happens to be listening to, if it was able, if it was listening to a completely different set of neurons, it would still be able to decode the activity of the whole population to arbitrary accuracy. And that's what you get from this holographic coding principle. Okay, uh, the next um, theorem um, is about this other type of pathology. So if we get um, decay that's faster than n to the minus one, but still slower than n to the minus one minus two over d, which is a weaker condition than n to the, uh, sorry, it, it, it's, it's possible to decay in principle between n to the minus one and n to the minus one minus two over d. If you had that, you'd still have a pathology. And the pathology would be that the code is not differentiable. Uh, in other words, if the, if the input space is a d-dimensional Riemannian manifold um, and it has a finite expected derivative, the gradient of the, um, the map from this manifold into the Hilbert space has a finite expectation of magnitude, then the eigenspectrum has to decay faster than n to the minus one minus two over d, where d is the dimension of the stimulus manifold. The proof of this uh, is, is based on two things. First, Green's theorem that lets you uh, relate the, uh, the, the squared magnitude of the derivative to the Laplacian operator. 
And secondly, Weil's asymptotic law, classical piece of differential geometry, that um, tells you about the eigenvalues of the Laplacian operator on a manifold, that they have to have asymptotically uh, order n to the min n to the two over d. And, and together these give you the, the theorem that you have a finite eigenvalue sum uh, only if the uh, eigenvalues decay uh, this fast, is the, is the derivative uh, have a finite expectation. So, so what would it mean uh, if this other weaker bound is not obeyed? It means that the population code uh, is continuous but not differentiable. So functions that are continuous but not differentiable have been around a long time and they're, they're, they're called fractals. Um, they're, they're functions that can be continuous everywhere but differentiable nowhere. And, and a good example of this is coastlines, which approximately fractals. And as shown in this uh, fake uh, movie here, the point about a fractal is the smaller details you go into, the finer details you see. And that's why it's not differentiable. Because as you go closer and closer, the, the, the angle of this uh, coastline just keeps changing. So the, the final theorem tells us if, if the, um, <clears throat> If the neural manifold, that's the representation in the in the n-dimensional space of neurons, has a topological dimension d, um, uh, in other words, if the stimulus has dimension d, and its eigenvalues decay slower than this bound, it must be a fractal. Okay, so that's the end of the map. I hope it made some sort of sense. Um, but the point is, essentially, that we have two bounds. There's the bound of n to the minus one that says the code can't be continuous, and n to the minus one minus two over d, which says it can't be differentiable. So let's look at an illustration of this. What we're going to do is take this torus, two dimensional torus, and project it into a 10,000 dimensional space such that the eigenspectrum by construction has a, a power law, and we're going to look at different exponents of the power law. So it's going to start off here uh, with exponent three, then it's going to slowly decay. When it gets to two, that's one plus two over d, but d equals two, it's going to become a fractal. And when it gets to exponent one, it's going to become discontinuous. And what we're seeing here on the right is a three-dimensional random projection of that 10,000-dimensional representation of this torus. That's where this figure came from. It's a, it's a topological torus that comes from blasting this into a 10,000 dimensional space and then taking a three dimensional random projection. And at the bottom, we see the three coordinate functions of this on the torus. All right, so let's animate it. Okay, so hopefully you can see some sort of movement here that it's starting to kind of stretch out a bit as this um, um, slope gets smaller. And it's getting more and more crinkly when we approach uh, alpha equals two, that's the critical value for fractal, you see that now it's got this rough local structure, which means that it's no longer differentiable uh, locally. And as the dimension, uh, as the uh, eigenvalue exponent keeps decreasing, we're getting towards one, where it's become discontinuous. And now it doesn't even look like a torus, it looks like a, a, a sea urchin. And the point is that every pair of points here has been mapped to somewhere completely different uh, in, this, in this space. You can see at the bottom, the coordinate maps look like white noise because however close you are on this original stimulus set, they, they're now completely different uh, in, in the 10,000 dimensional space and that's the three dimensional projection of it. So we've lost continuity and that's why this would be a bad representation because there can't be any generalization because it's discontinuous. Okay, so, so just to finish off, now we can come back to biology because remember, we've got these two predictions. If the eigenvalues decay slower than n to the minus one, the code can't be continuous. That's really pathological. If it decays slower than n to the minus one minus two over d, it can't be differentiable. That's still pathological, but not quite as pathological. So which one is true? Well, if d is large, one plus two over d is about one anyway, so we can't tell the difference. It might be that that value of 1.04 we got is because d is really around uh, 50. Uh, 
So what we can do is make D smaller to distinguish them. And the way we do that is we create stimuli of low manifold dimension. And now we show these uh, to the mouse. And the, the prediction is that the eigen spectrum should now decay faster. And the way we do that is we just take the image net stimuli and we project them onto a, a basis set uh, of, of, of low dimensional uh, basis vectors. I could talk about how we get those, it's not really important. And we get things like this um, that are drawn from an eight dimensional space of images. And we get as many as we had as the original images. And remember that before we got an exponent of around one, the prediction is now we show these different images, we'll no longer get an exponent of one, we'll get an exponent that needs to be at least 1.25, because that's one plus two over D where D equals eight. Uh, and experimentally, we see that we actually do get that. We now get 1.49. Uh, similarly, if we make four dimensional images, now we should again have a larger exponent because it needs to be greater than 1.5. And we find that, yes, we get a larger exponent. This time it's 1.65. And if we show a whole lot of different stimuli uh, of different dimensionality, we find that the exponent is always on the safe side of the curve, so that the, um, the, the, the stimulus representation manifold does not need to be a fractal. It can be a smooth manifold. Okay, so. To summarize, um, the math says that if the eigenspectrum decays of, of the kernel function decays slower than n to the minus one minus two over d, then the population code can't be differentiable. If it decays slower than n to the minus one, then it can't be continuous. Experiment says it's faster than both, but it's close to n to the minus one minus two over d. And that suggests that the brain gives almost as much weight as it can to fine details of the stimulus before these fine details dominate the representation of the derivative and mean you've no longer got a differentiable representation but a fractal. So the interpretation is that neural codes have to balance two desirable properties. First, orthogonality, so different stimuli can be easily distinguished, and slower eigenspectrum decay means more orthogonality. Second is smoothness, so that similar stimuli can be represented similarly. Faster eigenspectrum decay means more smoothness. And it seems like the brain has figured out how to make the eigenspectrum decay just fast enough to the, for the code to remain smooth while being otherwise as orthogonal as possible. It also means the code is holographic in the sense that this large enough subpopulation of neurons carries full information about the entire population and its derivative. All right, so I just want to finish with a, 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 another possible connection to, to machine learning. Um, so I guess you all know the phenomenon of adversarial attack, which is that you can take a, a, a deep network that's been trained to do one thing, and if you add to it a bit of very judiciously chosen noise, you can fool the network into completely misclassifying anything at all. And the point is that this reflects a lack of smoothness. It reflects the fact that the derivative of this network is absolutely huge in the wrong directions. If you, if you find the direction in which the derivative is huge, you can completely skew uh, the output. And, and, and maybe these results so the brain has found a way to avoid uh, this problem. Um, and, and that's it. So um, thanks very much. Uh, thanks to Carson, Marius and Matteo, to our funders and all the people um, who helped and thanks for you for joining. Uh, and if there's any questions, go ahead. I guess if nobody else has any questions, I sort of have a question. Um, so um, one thing that's kind of, uh, so, you've, so you've interpreted um, all of the mathematics that you've shown in terms of uh, kernels and reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. But these methods are 
very closely connected to uh, Gaussian process methods. So I'm wondering if um, sort of some of the interpretations that you've given can also be thought of in that way. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, so let me clarify something. So, so these are Hilbert spaces, but they're not RKHSs. They are L2 spaces. Um, so uh, th th there are kernel functions, uh, but they're not reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, they're, they're L2 spaces. Um, so can they be interpreted in terms of um, Gaussian processes? Um, yes, uh, I, I would think so. so Making the connection to machine learning again, the, the, the point is that um, you, you've got a, a kernel function on uh, your, your stimulus space, K of S uh, and S prime, uh, and um, this is a property that the kernel function ought to have. And as for what readout you have of it, I don't think that really matters. Um, so you could have a, the, the one that, that I worked through the math of is a, a delta rule, um, which is, it actually, I think, does become equivalent to a, a Gaussian process learning because it's, it, it's, it's equivalently ridge regression on, uh, on, on this Hilbert space and, and therefore it is a, um, it is equivalent to Gaussian process uh, regression. So, so absolutely, um, I think this is, is, is a way to say that there's a, a constraint on the kernel functions, the Gaussian processes or support vector machines or whatever you like, um, that would allow good generalization. And, and actually, the kernels that are used in machine learning pretty much all obey this. The one that doesn't obey it, well, it, it obeys it by the letter, but not the spirit of the, the law, is, is actually the um, the um, radial basis kernel, um, which it, it, it does decay fast enough, but it, it, it basically, the, the principal component spectrum of that looks kind of flat, and then it jumps off a cliff. Um, but it's, it's not this smooth kind of power law de decay that you would get, that we see in the brain. So I don't know what that means. For RBF, uh, why? Because I thought for RBF, the uh, spectral density is just gonna be a Gaussian density. Or am I thinking of the wrong thing? Uh, okay, so so in high dimension, so you're right, but the point is in high dimensions, if you take the oh yeah 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 in high dimension it's in, in high dimension that thing's not going to work because it's a distance based kernel. So in high dimensions, I can completely believe you because essentially the spectra is going to look like some sort of um, much it's closer to some sort of white noise like thing. Exactly, it's going to be white noise and then it's going to fall off suddenly uh -huh. to zero when you when you exceed uh, that that number and and so so yeah so that's what the brain seems not to be doing but then it's not dealing with it as you say with a low dimensional stimulus space mm -hmm. okay Thanks. we had a couple of questions on the the chat so can you use um the uh this idea to, to regularize activations in a neural net. So yes, I think you can. So the first thing is there's something called Jacobian regularization, uh, which was um, developed, I think it came out last year, as a, as a response to adversarial attack. Um, and, and that, I think, would give you this property. You could also try uh, putting a, um, a regularization regularizer that directly imposes a power law um, on a neural network. Um, when answering this question, go back to PCS. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, um, okay. Here we are. Um, yeah, and, and in collaboration with uh, some people at uh, uh, SUNY Stony Brook, we've had a go at that, and it has some sort of uh, promising uh, looks. But yes, that, that, that's a good idea to try and do a regularization like that. 
um, and um, but we haven't uh, we, we've only just started looking at it. Okay, uh, from uh, from Felix, are there any stronger requirements on the power law decay if you were to assume, say, second derivatives have to be continuous? Yes, uh, that would be one plus four over d. So um, uh, the, the the spectrum has to decay faster than n to the minus one minus four over d. And again, the um, if you want third derivatives, it's one plus six over d, um, etc. Uh, and if you want it to have infinitely differentiable, it has to be faster than any uh, power law. In other words, it has to be something like exponential. Um, from Pascal, um, orthogonal and root smooth representations. Pascal, do you want me to go back to the slide on orthogonal and smooth representation? I don't quite understand what you're saying. Ah, okay. No, I was just commenting on what you were saying earlier. Okay. So, well, if you have a question, then then ask it. But uh, I'm uh, okay. You're already answered it. Fine. Okay. Um, from Dan. Oh yeah, the question about okay. PCS. I, I, okay. Sorry, I didn't finish typing the question, so I'll just no, say. No problem. Um, um, so. There's a conversation going on at the moment about GANs. For example, whether it's possible to smoothly move between, for example, two labels whilst maintaining a realistic image. And intuitively, it feels like it wouldn't be possible to, for example, move from dog to fish with every image in between being a realistic image. So there's sort of two questions, one being, um, in the stimulus space, I imagine you you had, for example, from tree to fish. There'll be a lot of things in between tree and fish that are nonsense, and how yeah. are those handled? And then the second question, sorry, sort of related would be this uh, result that you've obtained about the smoothness, would it be maintained under transformations? Like, for example, um, I imag imagine this would be the output of a generator would you expect the result to be maintained uh, on the input to the generator? What sort of function would be needed to maintain that, uh, that result? So I've got to admit, I don't really know very much about GANs. So uh, okay. I can't really answer the question. Um, okay. So the, the first question and the first question about stimulus is. Okay, so the, the first question was about this kind of, and, and these are really just cartoons here. But the question is, if um, this is a fish and that's a tree, what's what's here in between them? And so I, I think the way I'd answer that is um, this is a manifold, um, but there can be a probability distribution on this manifold. So here is some sort of weird thing that's half tree and half fish, but the probability you'll ever see it is almost zero. Uh, in fact, you'll only ever see it if you're watching one of those weird um, inceptionism uh, movies. Um, so, so I think that's how you could have a manifold that has, in principle, these sort of in-between images, but the probability you'll ever see them is, is, is essentially zero. Did that, did that make any sense? Yes, it does. Um, so that the manifold is still smooth, essentially, in that case, because yeah, the, the, uh, right. you have something that's nonsense, but it's but it's yeah, not. Yeah. It, it has essentially a zero probability of of happening. Okay, so from Yi Hong, if the brain has to give as much weight to fine details, does this mean compressing neural network is impossible? Um, hmm. Okay. I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but I guess your point is, um, if, if we want to compress and we want to hold on to these details, um, can, we, can we do it? Um, and 
you can, of course, do lossy compression. If you're prepared to throw away the fine details, then you can you can certainly do that. Um, but if you want to hold on to those fine details, whereas while um, using less neurons um, to represent it, then I think that would be a problem. Yes. So so basically, I think if I've understood the question right, in terms of compression. What you want to do is reduce correlations between the neurons and, and the ultimate in compressed data is something that looks like white noise. There'd be no correlations at all between the different neurons. And then if you did that, then the eigenspectrum would be flat, right? It would be, it would be flat. And that would have all of these problems that we just talked about uh, in terms of um, not being able to, to generalize. So in other words, you add a tiny amount of noise to that representation and it would completely throw you off. Uh, and that's true, it would do that. It would almost actually do that by design because that's what data compression does, is it, it, it makes maximum use of your space. It gets rid of the redundancy. So even a little bit of noise will mean you, you're looking at a completely different uh, input. So, so, so yes, there's this trade-off between redundancy and, and noise robustness. And if you want to get rid of redundancy, you lose your noise robustness. And in fact, going right back to the beginning, this, this paper from, from Barlow that I recommend even, even people in machine learning, I would recommend to read both of these papers because they're, they're great. Um, this point here about uh, made by Barlow in 1962 is, is, is exactly that what the brain ought to be doing is getting rid of redundancy and, and in other words compressing the information uh, into the maximum number of bits per unit of energy the brain uses but that has the problem that it loses robustness and generalization um, so I hope that answered your question uh, Yihong. All right. Okay, good. Any others? Um, yeah, so at the start of the talk, you mentioned some things about um, orthogonality of the feature vectors and one-shot learning. I'm mm -hmm. uh, wondering if, did you explore that at all with the, the feature representations that you got? Um, oh, that's a good idea. Um, no, we didn't do that, but that, that's, a good, that's a good idea. Okay. Yeah, that would, that would be a good idea. That's a good project, actually. Yeah. And let me say, actually, while, while we're here, um, I don't know if you guys are already deep into your PhDs or not, but we have tons of data. And if anybody's interested in analyzing some of this data to look at these sort of questions, there's loads of things left to be done. Uh, the, the people who collected this data have moved on and left the data. We've got a lot more data like this, and there's questions of things like invariant image representations that we'd love to address. And, and if anybody's interested, please please let me know. The reason I'm saying that is that you just had a suggestion there for quite a good um, quite a good uh, project. Cool. Yeah. All right. Any other any other questions? Okay, great. Well, thanks a lot. And um, hopefully, as the Queen said, hopefully we'll meet again uh, in, in person. Uh, so looking, looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.